This episode of The History Guy brought to you by Ground News, the world's first news comparison platform. You might have noticed lately that the price of eggs has gone up, or sometimes it's hard to find chicken at the grocery store. And that's because last year there was a major outbreak of avian flu. We spend a lot of time talking about human illnesses like flu and, gosh, COVID-19, but the price of eggs tell us that outbreaks among animals called epizootics impact us too, and one in 1872 caused a lot more inconvenience than just a rise in the price of eggs. In fact, much like COVID-19, it caused major economic and social upheaval because before the advent of motorized transportation, horses were the backbone of transportation in America, and a major flu outbreak among horses nearly crippled the nation. The great epizootic of 1872 deserves to be remembered. You know, just because I'm a history guy doesn't mean I don't care about current events. Like everybody, I like to follow the news, but it's really difficult today to get the whole story. In today's media environment, the news is full of media bias and misinformation. It's skewed by the financial interests of the news organizations. What news you see is manipulated by algorithms on social media channels, which give you all sorts of clickbait and sensationalized news. And frankly, to consume news today requires a lot of critical thinking. I like to give a balanced perspective on history, and I want to find a balanced perspective in the news. That's what I love so much about Ground News. Ground News is the world's first news comparison platform. It's a website and app that shows you how breaking news is being covered across the political spectrum. With just a swipe or a click, you can quickly compare articles from thousands of publications around the world, see the ownership and factuality of those sources. With Ground News, you can see how different stories are being covered by different outlets or even covered differently around the world. It can help you spot media biases, so you can better understand your own reading habits to see your blind spots. You can customize your feed to choose from over 150,000 topics, locations, or people, so you can follow History or the History Channel and see top stories, or look up the most current news about influenza. So if you're looking for a better way to stay informed about current events throughout the world, check out Ground News by going to ground.news slash historyguy. The influenza A virus is quite interesting because it infects humans, but also various animals, including bats, birds, pigs, horses, sheep, ferrets, cats, dogs, whales, and even seals. Humans can infect animals, animals can infect humans, and one species of animal can infect a completely different species. These are called variant influenza viruses, and they are fairly common, with approximately one case of swine flu infecting a human every year. A strain of horse flu jumped to dogs at a racetrack used for both events in 2004. Because of cross-species infection, people with pets should be careful to wash their hands when sick with seasonal influenza to protect not only other human household members, but also their animal friends. According to CDC, it is not at all uncommon for cats to catch seasonal flu from their owners. And in 2016, a veterinarian contracted bird flu from a cat. The relationship between animal and human influenza has been known since at least the 19th century, with the 1872 report of the United States Commissioner of Agriculture noting that the frequent coexistence of an epizootic guitar in man and horse, and to a lesser extent in other animals, lends some color to the hypothesis that they are due to closely allied causes. This report continues to suggest that although veterinary records throughout history are few and imperfect, records of human influenza epidemics may shed some light on possible equine epidemics. We know that as far back as 415 BC, Hippocrates and Livius mention an extraordinary number of mucosal maladies presumed to be the flu in the human population of Greece and Rome, and also in the Athenian army in Sicily. But the first record of flu-like symptoms in horses is from the Greek veterinarian Absurtus in approximately 330 AD. Then in 1299, an equine influenza swept through Europe, being described by Laurentius Rusius, an Italian veterinarian who wrote the first printed book on horses as such. The horses carried his head drooping, would eat nothing, ran from the eyes, and there was a hurried beating of the flanks. The malady was epidemic, and in that year, 1,000 horses died. Horses have played an integral role in humanity for millennia, but a 2012 study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences notes that despite decades of research across multiple disciplines, the early history of horse domestication remains poorly understood. Studying the mitochondrial DNA of modern horses, the study's authors conclude that horses were most likely domesticated in the Western Eurasian steppes some 6,000 years ago. 
They conclude that by showing that horse domestication was initiated in the western Eurasian steppe and that the spread of domestic herds across Eurasia involved extensive introgression from the wild, the scenario of horse domestication proposed here unites evidence from archaeology, mitochondrial DNA, and Y-chromosome DNA. But a 2012 edition of Science cautions not all researchers are convinced, however. Archaeologist Marsha Levine of the University of Cambridge thinks that using modern genetic samples to retrace horses' evolution is a dead end. There's been a mixing of cultures and a mixing of horses in this region for many thousands of years, she said. And so when you're looking at any modern horse, you just don't know where it's from. Despite their undetermined origins, the domestication of horses directly impacted human history. It allowed further and faster travel and military advantages. It affected the transmission of languages and disease. The use of horses made agriculture easier and increased trade, and thus early veterinarian studies prioritized horses and how to keep them healthy. As cities grew, horses became integral to their operation and the great flow of goods that drove the commerce both within and between metropolises. Most modern medical experts agree that flu viruses spread through contact with viral particles in droplets from an infected individual. On average, about 8% of the U.S. human population contracts the virus each year. Today, we're cautioned to wash our hands and cover our mouths, but in 1872, prior to widespread acceptance of germ theory and 20 years before viruses were discovered, horse owners were unaware of how to stop the spread of infection. Smithsonian Magazine noted in 2020, horse owners had few good options for staving off infection. They disinfected their stables and proved the animals' feed and covered them in new blankets. One wag wrote in a Chicago Tribune that the nation's many abused and overworked horses were bound to die of shock from this sudden outpouring of kindness. In late September 1872, the first cases of an outbreak of horse flu were reported about 15 miles outside of Toronto, Canada, in the townships of York, Scarborough, and Markham. Equine influenza has an infection rate of almost 100% in unvaccinated horse populations in a short incubation period of just one to three days. By October 1st, it had spread to Toronto. Within three days, it infected all major stables in the city. The October 9th edition of the Ottawa Daily Citizen stated that there are generally plenty of horses to be seen about the streets of the city. But yesterday, very few were to be met with, and more than one person who had to leave town early found that a cab was almost impossible of attainment. The article continues. The cause of this dearth of the means of locomotion is a catarrhal fever of an epizootic nature, accompanied by sore throat, hacking cough, redness of the nasal mucous membrane, hot mouth, staring coat, and cold extremities, all symptoms sufficiently alarming. The writer ends with, let us hope in the present case that there is nothing more serious than a severe general influenza amongst the horses, that we shall have experienced but a brief period the inconvenience of a partial deprival of the services of the noble animal. It should be noted that the recovery time from equine influenza is usually around two to three weeks, with veterinarians generally recommending a week of rest per day of fever and at least three days minimum rest. So the disruption was not going to be brief. The virus spread onward, having infected Montreal and Quebec by October 18th and entering the U.S. within the month, presumably from several sick horses brought into Detroit on October 10th or 11th. There, it was known as the Canadian horse disease and was reported in Buffalo, New York on October 14th. On October 20th, it had reached Pennsylvania. The next day, reports came from New Hampshire. Boston, Jersey City, Brooklyn, and New York reported cases on October 22nd. The next day, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Vermont, Maine, Ohio, and Illinois. On October 24th, the New York Herald reported 15,000 horses stricken with chills and fever. On October 26th, they listed the number as 30,000. An entire page of the newspaper described the conditions at various stables that day and noted, Soon New Yorkers, it is to be feared, will have to cry with almost as much earnestness as Richard III, my kingdom for a horse, and will be gladdened by no response. A poem written by a DMJ was published in the Indianapolis Journal on November 22nd. Not a sound was heard in the silent street, as home from the concert we hurried. We found not a streetcar, carriage, nor bus, and we felt considerably worried. We hailed a driver we used to know and hurriedly asked him the reason. He said, as he sadly lowered his head, the horses were all a sneezing. Experts of the day were befuddled. James Law, professor of veterinary science at Cornell University, wrote in the 1872 report by the United States Commissioner of Agriculture that neither temperature, nor climate, nor electricity, nor magnetic conditions, nor even remarkably acrid or fetid fogs affected the transmission of the equine influenza. The equine population fell swiftly to the infection, the cost being heard throughout the street until the owners were forced to stop using them for fear of working them to death. 
In the Boston Globe, Daniel Doherty of Beverly Street sent 25 healthy horses out at noon and by nightfall. All were reported sick. This forced immobilization of entire fleets of horses and brought cities to a temporary halt. Streets were described as empty and deserted. Storehouses at docks were brimming with cargo and goods that were not being distributed by horse and cart as quickly as they were arriving by boat. Streetcar companies were forced to take fewer trips, and so the cars that were running were overly full, stressing the animals that were still able to work. The economic impact was instantaneous, with the New York Herald reporting that it cost more to transport goods than the cost of the goods themselves. The New York Sun further detailed that one Damon demanded and received $42, approximately the equivalent to $1,000 today, for one load of cotton, a job taking no more than an hour and a half. The editors of the Richmond, Virginia Daily State Journal alleged that the horse disease is a calamity seriously affecting the business interests of the city. It is worse. It is the excuse for extortion. The Baltimore Sun claimed that the Washington market was losing nearly $50,000 a day. In October, the Montpelier, Vermont Daily State Journal wrote, the epizootic has already cost the country millions. Professor Sean Carrage of York University in Toronto wrote in a 2013 edition of the journal Environmental History, whether on the streets of Boston or the streets of New Orleans, horses powered the flow of goods and people within urban environments. They also biologically linked those environments to one another. The sudden loss of that power revealed the common characteristic and vulnerability of North American cities as equine habitat and the transportation network that could bind cities into a single disease pool. By rail, by water, and by hoof, Professor Courage concludes, the great epizootic flowed through the North American urban network as if through blood vessels, revealing the intimate material interconnections among cities that tied their ecologies together. Although not particularly deadly, fatalities range from less than 1% in many rural areas up to 5 and even 10% in some urban areas. This made a drastic impact on the workforce. Where populations exceeded 100,000, there was an average of one horse for every 15 people. The 1870 United States Census recorded 7.1 million horses, 1.1 million mules, and 39 million people. In 1880, New York's horse car ridership was approximately 161 million passengers, pulled by over 11,000 horses and mules on 136 miles of track. It is estimated that prior to 1910, 90% of all public works, agriculture, and resource industries utilized horsepower. They were used not only for moving goods and people, including the mail, doctors, milk, and hearses, but to power ferry boats. They drove gears in mills and factories to saw wood and pump water. They worked underground in mines to lift coal out. Without horses in the mines, there loomed the threat of a fuel shortage. Fuel prices skyrocketed. Produce that wasn't being distributed rotted at the docks, so steamships cut back their freight, which affected the wages of the dock workers. Mail went out more slowly via wheelbarrows, and social events dwindled. Who wants to walk to a wedding or a funeral? The Boston Globe noted a sad falling off for churches, as none but the most devout appeared at services. Sale of disinfectants and various remedies, however, flourished. Some stable hands declared that a fair mixture of good common sense was essential and a stimulating liniment to the throats of the horse. Other options included tinctures of arsenic or gin in ginger. Some suggested using a bucket of hot water with chamomile under the animal's nose and placing a blanket over the head for a steaming effect. An apothecary by the name of Mr. Hollis created a mixture which appeared to be hot drops with a tincture of tansy. Burning tar was thought to dispose the malodor. C.C. Potter of number 243 Friend Street added a burnt boot to the mix for good measure, or supposedly a happy combination of both expectorant and fumigation. Some offered little food to the sick, who didn't have much of an appetite anyway, while others thought that to be ridiculous. Food, after all, is energy. The sanitary superintendent in Chicago reminded owners that not working sick animals is not only humane, but economical, since they will recover sooner. Suffice it to say that opinions were across the board. Some didn't believe the epidemic to even be real, and not every horse was sick, and some stables seemed to have avoided it altogether. One stable hand claimed to be able to treat his sick charges as well as any vagabond veterinary surgeon in the United States. Some unusual changes were found quite amusing. Boston seemed to have quite the sense of humor, when the Metropolitan Band led three teams of 200 men pulling loads of cabinet organs to the docks. A team of oxen pulled a carriage, causing much amusement and a reprieve from the sullen mood. On November 9th, at the outbreak of the Great Boston Fire, the engines had to be hauled by men rather than horses, a job for which the fire department's chief engineer had preemptively hired extra men, and investigations conclude that their response was delayed by only minutes. The front page of the Baltimore Sun on October 31st covered the epidemic in detail. 
stating that hundreds of mules were brought in to substitute for disabled horses and that 50 cows had recently died from the same illness. The Alton Telegraph on December 20th added a new little ditty. Mary had a little lamb. She asked a man to shoot it. And when he went to kill the lamb, it had the epizootic. The disease ended up spreading from Nova Scotia down to Florida, across the country along rail lines, even to Mexico, Cuba, and Central America. There were outbreaks along the West Coast in the spring of 73. The impact of the great epizootic of 1872 was enormous. Smithsonian Magazine opined that the pandemic caused economic and social paralysis comparable to what would happen today if the gas pumps went dry and the electrical grid went down. And it's kind of hard to imagine that we could have had a gas crisis before we had automobiles. But what that really says is, is that commerce was so interconnected at the time that a problem in one place could easily spread to other places and then reveal vulnerabilities throughout the entire system, which is very much like the supply chain crisis that we've been dealing with recently. But like all epidemics, the illness did slowly fade and the economy slowly recovered. You might have thought that this would have compelled cities to move to alternative forms of transportation, but the technology just wasn't there yet. The first electric streetcar wasn't installed in America until 1885, and motorized buses and trucks weren't really available until the turn of the century. And for the most part, life went on after the great epizootic, pretty much the way that it had before. Perhaps its greatest impact, though, was to remind us all of how important these animals were to society which bolstered public support for the nascent animal rights movement, which was seeking legislation for the protection and care of animals. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you have to do is subscribe.